we're recording. All right. Well, welcome everybody to, again, to our Faith in the Future series with our presenter today, Lindsay Bates. I'm going to do a little introduction and then just pass it over to Lindsay. Um, so it's, a, it's an honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Lindsay Bates, um, a native of Minnesota. She crossed state lines for her undergraduate degree at University of Wisconsin, where she earned her BS in uh, community and nonprofit leadership and entrepreneurship. Uh, following college, she served as a volunteer with the ELCA Young Adults in Global Mission Program, known as YAGAM, where she lived and taught in Cambodia for a year. Um, afterwards, she served as the middle school ministry director at St. Andrew Lutheran Church in Eden Prairie, um, Minnesota, her home church, for almost two years before heading to Princeton Theological Seminary to pursue her Master of Divinity degree. Um, she's now in her final year at Princeton, uh, where for the last two years, she has been researching innovative faith communities, working with Professor Kenda Dean, who is one of the leading voices and teachers and authors about church innovation in the church today in America. Um, and uh, Kenda is also the director of the Zoe Project in which UDLC participated in the Young Adult Ministry Zoe Project. Uh, and Kenda is actually how Lindsay and I got connected uh, and how she came to be with us here at Upper Dublin. Um, Lindsay is a candidate for ordained ministry in the ELCA, and we are proud to have called her our field ed student and now our pastoral associate. So welcome and thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Keith. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Hi, everybody. So um, we're going to be talking today about innovative ministries, and then I promise there will be time for Q&A and that this is, as this slide says, um, just a starting place for this conversation. And so my main goal today is to give us um, some ideas and some ways to get our wheels turning about what ministry might look like in the future at UDLC um, in, a, in a new, in a fresh way um, that is sort of, I'm thinking of as in addition to the things we're already doing really well, right? None of these ideas are now UDLC functions as a coffee shop and we stop doing all the wonderful things we're doing. That would be kind of silly. And so we are going to be thinking today about ways we can expand um, UDLC ministries, ways we can build on things that we are already passionate about at this church. Um, so innovative ministries, this is just a, oh, sorry, hang on. I, I can't, hang on. I can't see my cursor when I share my screen and I can't move my face out of my own way. Oh dear. Okay. Success. All right. So innovative ministries. Um, what I'm presenting today is what Dr. Dean and I would call incomplete, biased, unreliable, and hopeful, which means this um, project we undertook was to create cards. I have a hundred of them here with me. They'll be on the screen. Don't worry. I'm not expecting you to like read this. Um, that would be a starting place for um, churches and faithful people who want to do ministry differently. Um, and all of these ideas are um, ways that God creatively disrupted systems of our world to meet the needs of God's people. And we say they're incomplete because there are plenty of ideas that didn't make their way into this cards, uh, these cards, unfortunately. They're biased because they are people and places that uh, Dr. Dean and myself and our other research associate, uh, Mel Temple, were able to find. They're unreliable because the world is changing quickly. And a lot of this is what we could find from websites and Facebook pages. Um, but we also think that they are hopeful that all of the ways I'm going to present on today of people doing ministry in a new way gives us hope for the church um, in our ever-changing world. Um, I'm not sure if you have read articles about churches dying like I have, but sometimes it can be um, the opposite of hopeful if you think about where the church is in our world. Um, and if you focus only on negative statistics, such as fewer people in church views on Sunday mornings, I can see how that would be that would be negative, but all of these ideas are ways that faithful people have adapted so that they can creatively disrupt systems in our world to meet the needs of God's people. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. So our goal is to dream. There will be plenty of time for Q&A once I'm done presenting. Um, and our goal is to just start thinking about what ministry at UDLC could look like 
None of these are ideas are things that I think UDLC should do. They were made in different contexts by different people. Um, but all of them are ways that we could extend God's grace to, um, to the people around us in our communities. So in order to talk about innovative ministry, we need to talk about what ministry is. Um, I think sometimes if we aren't if we aren't really digging into what we believe ministry to be, we can attach ministry to programs, right? So um, ASP trips at UDLC are a ministry program. And sometimes we might think that ministry looks like um, sending teens on a trip um, to Appalachia. And ministry does look like that, but that's not necessarily what ministry is. Likewise, worship on Sunday morning is ministry, um, but ministry isn't only worship. What um, I'm defining as ministry for the purpose of this research project and this presentation, and if you would like to um, push back on this, there definitely can be time for that later, but um, how I'll be defining ministry today is walking with people through life. Um, and so it is that broad, it is that simple, it is that difficult to pin down as everyone needs something different to walk through life, right? We all need different levels of support at different times. Um, and I would like to point out that this is how UDLC is already functioning in our community, right? We already walk with people when, when people need meals because they are grieving or had a new baby, UDLC people provide that for them. Um, I think of COVID vaccines and the number of UDLC um, members who have just started getting appointments for other people because the systems are complicated. They're walking with people through life in a time when they need it. And so that is what these ministries are seeking to do. Um, I would add to this that ministry does not have an end date. So a lot of educational programs at UDLC have an end date, right? We have a book club and it, it has an end date. Um, and as we think about innovative ministries, we want to create ministries that will continue to walk with people through life in an ongoing basis. Um, and that requires envisioning communities, economies, and systems in the world that functions the way God calls us to function. So something we'll find is that innovative ministries are, um, they're ways of disrupting systems in our communities. Um, and so one example of that would be that we often um, give away food here at UDLC. We do a really great job feeding people who need food by um, partnering with Feast for Justice and other organizations. And that is one system that is meeting a need. Um, but a lot of these, um, a good number of these actually innovative ministries focus on hunger in changing the system. So an organization we'll learn about later on is called Food Maven and their ministry is um, not to give food away, but to connect farmers who have excess food with people who cannot afford food, with restaurants who would like locally sourced food but need to get it more efficiently or cheaper, with grocery stores who need food. And so their way of ending hunger is by um, addressing a break in the system and working to fix that. And an important note is that the director of that organization is a pastor at a church that still does food drives, right? This isn't saying anything negative about how our ministries have done in the past, but it's recognizing that if we fix systems, um, ministry won't have an end date, that we can sort of create um, ongoing cultures and economies in our communities that are more aligned with God's mission. And so um, we're going to watch a video clip here in just a second where um, the, the Foots, um, a couple talks about creating a coffee shop to employ people with disabilities, where they say that people are our passion, coffee is our language. And I want you to pay attention how, to how they're combining um, an economic venture with a way to um, care for and serve people. I struggled a lot with church and fitting into church and I struggled a lot with depression to a point where I was in a really, really dark place. My mom is an amazing woman. She's an entrepreneur. She's incredible. And I just remember talking with her 
You know, I said, Brett's going to seminary and he has this dream and he has this vision. And I was like, mom, I want that. Like, what am I doing? And my brother, um, who has a disability, incredible guy. His name's Eric. So I was talking with her and we were talking about how I love, I've always loved coffee shops because I love the environment of a coffee shop and people connect in coffee shops. But I really am passionate about working with people with disabilities and that was my normal growing up. Um, and so my mom said, you know, Laura, why don't you, why don't you start a coffee shop and employ people affected by disability? And I was like, well, mom, I don't actually know anything about coffee. And Brett bought me a, a class. You can take classes at specialty coffee shops. And I was gonna find out if I could learn anything about coffee and, I don't know, make this dream a thing. To me, that was a pivotal, life-changing moment. And I connected with God through the craft of coffee, and I learned about his creation. And as I explained to Brett, I felt like I finally could see in color again. So it is about coffee in the sense like, I think God's creativity shines so incredible through coffee, and I think it's a way that you can worship God and connect with God, and at the same time, there's this beautiful place for community and people to come together. The, the quote that comes to my mind is from Luther, and Luther says, the Christian shoemaker does good work not by putting little crosses on shoes, but by making very good shoes. And so, it's not about coffee, but it is. People are our passion, coffee is our language. And I think that's what it, like that will bring us together. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, so, so coffee, coffee is our conduit to, to reach people and, and to affect change in the disability community um, and to provide employment in the disability community, sustainable employment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's not about coffee, but it really is about coffee but it's about church too. And it's about, it's about the it's about the people that will be affected. It's not about coffee, but it is about coffee, but it's about people, but it's about church too. I hope that that video helped you sort of see some of the connections that um, we're going to be making today and if there's one thing I know for darn sure, it's that UDLC loves people and loves being welcoming. And innovative ministries are taking that idea sort of outside of our building, right? It's, it's how do we welcome people into the kingdom of God, into the love and community of UDLC, trusting that they might not walk through those doors. And so what, what vehicles, what languages can we get passionate about because it will help us serve our people? Um, our people being defined, at, defined as God's people, which does mean everybody, I'm pretty sure. So we're looking for new vehicles to love people. And this isn't necessarily anything new. I think we, we are aware instinctually that sort of focused ministries work. So ASP is a great example of this at UDLC, recognizing that teens, um, might be interested in going on ASP and then that that would give us lots of time to love on and build uh, build relationships with those kids and that um, the ministry is happening while other ministry is happening, right? All of the adult leaders and Ray are able to build ministry with the, or build, my goodness, build relationships with the youth on ASP while they are working to build relationships and help other people. And innovative ministries work very similar to this model. Um, this is not about asking people, what do you need from church? All right, um, it's about asking, what do you need? And believing that God is calling us to meet those needs. And so we're not, we're not focusing on how we might get people in this building necessarily, though we might use our wonderful building as a resource to love people well. One great example of how you can build an innovative ministry is this organization, Breaking Cycles. Their motto is for the love of Portland, for the love of people. And what Breaking Cycles is, is it is a coffee and bike shop. So there's sort of a coffee shop in the front and a bike shop in the back that employs youth who are at risk of becoming homeless 
and providing them with an income and job training and skills. They get an adult mentor and they get a safe space to spend their time in. And um, I actually had the privilege of meeting um, Rana who runs Breaking Cycles. And we asked her sort of, why coffee and bikes? And she said, because people in Portland really love coffee and bikes. And so her quote is where the passion God placed in me meets the passion for those in your community, which is to say that Rana only really cared about ending youth homelessness. That was her end goal. And she needed a way to, um, to help those youth. And so when she was talking with homeless and at risk of being homeless youth, they were saying, well, it would be great if we could have an income that could help us not be homeless. And a lot of them maybe didn't have sort of stable mentors or adults in their lives who were investing time in them. And sometimes they needed safe spaces to go that were outside of their homes, um, but didn't cost money, didn't sort of place expectations on them. And so she said, well, the only way I can pay you is if I'm sort of running a business that's bringing in income so that I can pay you. That's really the only sustainable way to do it. And so she knew that Portland, her community, loves bikes, loves coffee. Great. Coffee bike shop. Um, and then she found some adults who know how to fix bikes, who were willing to work for this organization as a means of mentoring and caring for those youth. And Rana is really great at adapting to circumstances to meet needs. Um, an example of this would be that when she was running this program after about a year, the, the youth she was employing said that they needed more hours and she, she didn't quite know how to get that for them. And then she realized that there were bike races almost every week um, in Portland. And so they created a little mobile pop-up coffee stand that they would bike to bike races and sell coffee at the bike races so that she could give her youth more hours to be employed and more hours to be in a safe environment. Um, and so that's just one example that we're gonna look at today. Um, I have a couple warnings for you before we go much further into this presentation. Um, the first is that we talk a lot about youth or young adults only because that is where churches feel comfortable innovating. These ideas do not only work for youth, they work for all humans. Um, but we have a lot of examples of youth and young adults because that is where churches have felt it's safe to innovate. Um, and I think I would challenge UDLC to, we're, we're better than that. <laughs> we understand that innovation can happen um, for people of all ages. Um, the next warning is that we will fail if we try to do this. At some point, we will utterly, completely fail. None of, no successful business, no successful ministry has um, become successful by however we would like to define that without failing and trying again. That's just how innovation and creativity works. Um, I would add that not doing anything, not changing our ministries at all at Upper Dublin would also be a failure because it would be failure to meet people where they are, but that's just me. Um, my final caveat is that new ministries might become self-sustaining, but they will probably not increase UDLC's budget. And what I mean by that is a hilarious number of these ministries started because churches had a budget shortfall. And so they said, what can we do to make money? And what they found along the way was great ways to do ministry that hopefully will sustain themselves. And we'll talk about how some of these things are funded, but um, did not increase their budget. And so I'm just gonna warn you right now that um, we're not going to be able to um, fund our current ministries with new innovative ministries, but we can plan and try um, and have our innovative ministries fund themselves. So when we're talking about innovative ministries, we're working across categories. So we tried in our research project to put ministries into boxes because it would have made life a lot neater if they would just fit into little boxes. Um, so we were like, well, worship communities, housing, things addressing food insecurities, education, mentorship, ethical commerce. There are, there are tons of possible categories, but every single card I have here fits in more than one of them. And that's because these ministries are creating healthy communities where one person's needs meets another's ability, but every interaction is mutual. 
which is flipping sort of the script of what some traditional ministries have done at all churches, not just UDLC, but it's, it's changing from offering services to people to creating economies, um, whether the economy is finance or relationship or whatever, that will create like a mutually beneficial cycle that again, looks a lot more like the kingdom, kingdom of God than maybe our world does now. So one example that just hits a lot of different categories is the old school cafe. The old school cafe employs youth at risk of homelessness to run a 1920s themed jazz club, sourcing local foods and providing an entertaining meal experience to promote community engagement while educating the community on how to spot and prevent violent situations while supporting most local jazz musicians while providing formal training for the youth employed so they can find positions elsewhere, which is like, it's mind bending how many ways and how many different needs they're addressing in their community. They have a job training program that includes paid positions for youth who have been identified as either in a violent or potentially violent home situation. And while they're doing this, they're educating everyone who comes in their door on how to um, notice and prevent and get help for those who need it, who are in violent home situations. And secondarily, they believe that providing a fun experience for the community is a ministry. It's building relationships in a community that maybe don't already exist, right? If people are watching a show and maybe talk to the table next to them, they call that ministry and that's an important part of their model. And then they are also able to employ musicians. And so they're addressing a whole lot of problems in their community by wanting, running one social enterprise. Another example would be the yoga chapel. So <laughs> yoga chapel is a worshiping community that embodies storytelling through movement and find worship in pr the practice of yoga. And so um, if you go to a yoga chapel and there are many of these across the United States at this point, you'll be hearing biblical stories while doing movements of yoga. And you are um, just like our worshiping community calls us to honor God and serve God outside of Sunday morning, yoga chapels do the same thing. They, they educate and help their people um, embody God's grace beyond the mat once they, once they leave the yoga chapel. There's a very similar model to this called the Underwood Park CrossFit, which is a community that worships while doing CrossFit workouts. So both of these social enterprises have recognized that some people need to move and that our faith is meant to be embodied. And they put that right into the worship experience. So those who might not feel drawn to or get much connection with God out of a more traditional worship service are able to do it through movement in their bodies. Another example of um, an innovative ministry is Gastro Church. Um, this church is intentional conversation about spiritual things over really good food. That's their whole church model. These photos are that they do a big uh, Harry Potter style fundraiser every year. Um, so if that's, that's why you're seeing snitches um, on cupcakes on your screen. And so this is a church community that is pop-up meals. So sort of one-time meals across Houston. And each meal is focused on an important conversation they believe needs to happen in their community. So it might be about, um, about issues. It might be about homelessness or a mental health issue. It might be about legislation that um, people are going to be asked to vote on in the next election and raising education about it. Um, it might just be about a simple faith practice that you can do on your own. And so they form each of their worship services, not around maybe the lectionary calendar as Upper Dublin does, but around conversations they think faith has something to say about. And they do it over a meal. So they start a liturgy and then they have this conversation as a part of their worship, um, expecting everyone who shows up to engage respectfully with one another. Um, and then they end their liturgy and they go out um, having had a respectful dialogue, which they believe is a form of worship. The Brookwood community um, is a community that employs um, adults with special needs and gives them meaningful jobs. So 
their tagline where adults with special needs contribute to the world. And it's an educational environment that creates meaningful jobs, builds a sense of belonging and validates dignity and respect for adults with disabilities. So similar to that coffee shop idea we heard earlier, um, big, big, which is Brooklyn um, community in Georgetown, um, is really passionate about providing safe spaces for adults with disabilities to contribute to the world. And they have decided to do that through um, selling workers jewelry cards and arts at a gift shop. They run a cafe, so some of their um, employees work in the cafe. And then they also have a greenhouse growing plants that they are then able to sell to the community. Casting Hope is one of my personal favorite ideas. It's so cool. Um, this is a youth ministry that employs youth to run a community composting initiative, gathering compost from community members and selling it to local gardeners once the composting process is complete. So this is a youth ministry that recognized the need for more sustainable garbage practices, right? Composting is more sustainable than throwing all of your natural waste into the trash. They recognized that need and they maybe needed a way to get youth involved um, that they would show up to, meaning um, demands are high on our youth today and a lot of them needed jobs. They needed employment and if they weren't coming to church, it wasn't because they weren't interested in faith development, but they the reality of their world was that they needed um, income and so they employ youth to collect compost, to compost it, and then to sell it back to local gardener, gardeners for a cheaper cost than um, they can get compost elsewhere. So they're helping those gardeners, gardeners, why is that a word I keep saying? Gardeners who are trying to do um, sustainable gardening, um, they're helping them by providing them compost at a lower cost. And during the pandemic, Casting Hope has actually expanded their services. So they've adjusted to the community around them by providing garden coaching to, um, remember back in like May when we were all stuck at home and we thought this is the year we're going to do all the things we always meant to do. And for a lot of people that was gardening, they started garden coaching. So they're helping first time gardeners um, learn how to garden while creating a more sustainable food environment for their community. Dorat is actually a Jewish ministry and it alleviates social isolation by pairing volunteers and personal care assistants with elderly who need assistance con to continue to live independently. And they are an insanely large network of folks who are able to provide needs, but like also friendship to elderly people. Um, and so all of their volunteers are trained on how to have conversations and just be, um, be friends with <laughs> elderly people who are trying to continue to live independently. And they, during the pandemic, have continued to do this. So they will drop off food on someone's porch, step 10 feet back, and then have a 10 to 20 minute conversation with them, um, maintaining the relational component. They've also become experts at helping people get on Zoom during the pandemic. Goodlands is an organization that provides information, insights, and implementation tools for Catholic churches um, to leverage their land holdings to assess pressing issues from environmental destruction to mass human migration. So churches in general, but particularly the Catholic diocese, um, own a lot of land. And Goodlands recognized that that land could be used to advocate for God's creation. Um, and so not instead of, but in addition to some of the things churches have traditionally done, which is, you know, cleaning up trash along highways and caring for um, land in more service oriented ways, Goodlands decided to leverage all the land that the Catholic Church owns as a means for advocating um, to address the environmental crisis. And that includes mapping, community organi organizing, government lobbying, and restorative agriculture. Um, and I will be honest, it's not clear how this one is funded. We think that it might just be um, grants from the Catholic Diocese. It's not necessarily um, as self-sustaining as some of the other ministries that we've looked at, but um, a really cool idea to think about what resources you already have and to think about a social issue that you feel called to change and then to use those two things together. Food Maven, which 
I mentioned earlier, um, their motto is good for profits, good for people, good for the planet. And it's an online marketplace and food logistics company bringing agility and flexibility to the US food system. And so it exists to capture food that would have been wasted and to sell it to restaurants, institutional kitchens, food pantries. Um, and the man here on the right, um, he's a pastor at a local congregation and he just, in trying to collect food for people who needed it, he just noticed that it was a really um, inefficient system, just food in the US in general. And so he is purely trying to save food from getting wasted and getting it eaten. And he's benefiting farmers by um, purchasing food from them that they would have otherwise not been able to sell, but purchasing, purchasing it at a lower cost so that he can sell it to people who maybe didn't purchase it at the high cost because they weren't able to. And in that way, he's able to work with ethical and sustainable farmers um, and sort of attempt to prop them up. And um, Growing Change is a group from a church reclaiming a former prison and turning it into a sustainable farm using a mentor and education program for youth who are at risk of entering the prison system. So this pro program is addressing um, health inequalities in Scotland County by providing fresh produce to those in need. It's hiring veterans to mentor youth who it's also hiring and educating. Um, and these youth, again, they're targeting those who might end up in the pri prison system. So it's, it's resurrecting land that was once a prison and trying to use it um, to keep people out of prison and help them thrive in their lives. Okay, um, raw tools. I told myself I was gonna start skipping some for time to get to Q&A, but they're also cool. Raw tools, um, they taught me how to forge my own necklace. They're super cool. Their um, tagline is disarm hearts, forge peace. And they have three core programs. Um, one is called Swords to Plowshares, which is where um, this youth pastor invites people to send him guns that maybe they've inherited that they don't they don't want they maybe um, don't believe in owning guns and so they send their guns to the youth pastor him and his father forge them into gardening tools which they then sell to fund their other two programs their other two programs are war no more which is a non-violence training program um, and Vine and Fig, which is a program that promotes community relationships through identifying nonviolent, story focused healing community partners. So, War No More is attempting to educate communities on how um, they can be less violent. And then Vine, Wine and Fig is um, sort of providing um, mental health community building tools for people who have experienced violence to begin to heal from that. Um, and all three of those programs work together quite well. We're gonna move past HBCU venture capital pretty quickly, but it is a venture capital firm um, helping train BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color students to um, participate in um, venture capital in a way that has been primarily white in the past. The Role of Boxing Christians is an online video game space that functions as church for youth who really love video games. Sparrow Furniture is a really cool organization that employs refugees um, and trains them on how to create really beautiful woodworking pieces and furniture while giving them language classes, um, mentorship, helping them understand um, how finances work in the US, taxes, all of the things that you wouldn't know if you didn't have um, someone who raised you in the US to teach those skills to you all while they're able to earn money um, and that's funded by the selling of the furniture and woodworking pieces, pieces Sparrow Furniture um, creates. Street Code Academy is teaching um, students of color as young as the first grade, as old as in college, um, how to hack and use technology um, so that they are able to get jobs in the tech industry and make it less white and more diverse. Tabor Space is a church that had extra space. So they opened a coffee shop where they um, employ young people who need to gain job skills. And then they are an open community gathering space where they encourage people to come 
um, do community education, they rent out rooms to different community groups, and they also function as a co-working space. So if you um, don't have an office, but you want to just go out into public to work, um, Tabor Space will let you rent different tables um, to do your work there. Columbia Future For Forge is a skills and mentoring program for teens. Um, this idea started when a youth pastor realized that he was having a hard time getting youth to come to church, but he was renovating his house. And if he offered um, to pay the youth $10 an hour to show up and help him renovate his house, they would. And while they were renovating his house, he got to have really important ministry conversations with them. And so when he asked them why they would come renovate his house, but not come to church, it was because um, they expressed that it was really hard to be a teenager nowadays and to get a job after high school or to get into college, they needed to prove that they had job skills um, and extra income was never a bad thing. And so he has started three social ministries now that all participate in the same job skills training program. So they have a mentorship and job skill training program where all of the youth come together and they're able to get certificates that prove they've been trained on certain skills. They get a mentor. And then all of the youth participate in one of the three programs. One of them is Motown Lawn Care. So they're able to go do lawn work for people um, and earn an income that way. One of them is the Upmost Weightlift Weight Training Gym, which um, is identifying another need in the community, which was just that sports are really important um, to youth in that community. And so they're not actually employed, but they're getting a really discounted um, rate to go to this weight training gym and they use Christian beliefs and practices in their gym. So it's a much more positive environment than most gyms. Um, they use a lot of different body positivity, body positivity training um, and just trying to make sure that um, the youth experience at the gym is not one of pressure or not being good enough, but one of how beloved they are. Or there's the Forge Drones training program which is a training program where um, students can actually get a license to show that they know how to run drones well. And then after they've gone through the training program, they're able to get jobs um, running drones for other businesses, taking photos and things like that. That is the extent of what I know about drones, but um, it sounds like a good thing when it's explained to me. Um, the Conference of Churches is a group of churches who decided to sort of combine their efforts to create one space for wholeness and wellness because they realized they were all sort of doing similar things to try and create community change. So they decided that it would be more efficient for them to work together. The Changemaker Initiative is a congregation that um, invites each member of their program, so a bunch of different congregation members to work on micro projects. So instead of picking one big project to work on together, they all work on micro projects and support each other through, um, through their network. And I think we're going to skip over these just so we can have time for Q&A, um, but those are all fun ideas as well and I can go back to them if necessary. So um, those are some, certainly not all, um, innovative ministries that are all working to, um, to address needs that the church cares about, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ has something to say about homelessness or about high incarceration rates or about um, youth finding community online and about our creation and caring for it well. And we just need to find maybe what, what language we're going to use. So um, those are the slides I have about innovative ministries. And I'm wondering if this is a great time for us to stop recording, turn on our videos and have a conversation. Sounds good. So everybody, if you want to um, turn off your video or turn on your video and um, join us and 